Good day, everyone. As usual, I hope you're doing well, staying safe, and uh, patiently waiting for our, our turn to get a shot. Okay. What are we covering today? Today we're going to talk about fiscal policy. And so fiscal policy has been spoken about only briefly before this. We're going to talk about it in a little more detail. But uh, fiscal policy refers to the government's choice on how much to spend on goods and services. So that's the big G in our model. It's also the government's choice on how much taxes to levy. That's the big T in our model. And similarly, it's the government's choice on how much transfers to provide to uh, households or agents. That's the TR in our model. So fiscal policy refers to spending, that's the G, tax, T, and transfer policy. Okay? So that's the umbrella that fiscal policy captures, spending, tax, and transfer policy. We're going to take a look at the impact of a change in fiscal policy on aggregate expenditure, how it shifts the planned expenditure line, and therefore how it affects aggregate demand. So we're going to incorporate fiscal policy into the income expenditure model and show how it connects to the aggregate demand curve through that. We're going to discuss how fiscal policy acts or works as an automatic stabilizer. We've mentioned before that the business cycle refers to short-run fluctuations of the economy, where the economy expands and contracts in the short run. Fiscal policy reduces the size of those fluctuations. Fiscal policy works the way it's been set up and designed in many countries, and in particular in our country here in Canada. Fiscal policy has been specifically designed so that it acts as an automatic stabilizer. It's kind of like uh, you'll read about how um, jet airplanes will have computer systems, software and hardware that work to automatically stabilize the airplane if they hit turbulence or if the, uh, uh, if the software detects that the pilot has lost consciousness or is, uh, is showing a effects of uh, you know, a lack of oxygen or whatever, the automatic systems will often take over and make sure that the plane stays stabilized so that we avoid hopefully, you know, a very bad outcome where the plane crashes and all the occupants get killed. And so fiscal policy works in that same sort of manner. The way fiscal policy has been set up, it doesn't amplify economic shocks. It works to reduce the size of those shocks. And that's a good thing, because that means we have a less severe business cycle. We're also going to talk about the effectiveness of fiscal policy at stabilizing fluctuations in output. Okay? And finally, we'll link this to other issues that are directly tied to fiscal policy. Things like the so-called government budget balance. Do we have a balanced budget? Do we have a surplus? Or do we have a deficit? And so fiscal policy directly plays into the government budget balance. Okay? And that also links fiscal policy to national debt. National debt is the total accumulation of debts outstanding that the nation owes. If you have a balanced budget, the government is breaking even. The revenues coming in from taxes completely offset or equal to the amount being spent on government spending on goods and services and transfers. And so the government is, when they have a balanced budget, is neither saving nor borrowing. Their savings are zero at the government level. And that keeps the national debt constant. But if you're running a budget deficit, the government is spending more than its income. So that means government spending of goods and services and transfers amount to a greater amount than tax revenue amounts to. And the government has a deficit. When they have a deficit, they borrow. And the amount of national debt grows. So the government budget balance, the so-called surplus or deficit of the government, the savings of the government, directly tied to or linked to national debt. And so I was reading uh, recently that uh, in the first nine months of the current fiscal year, uh, Canada's fiscal year federally starts, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, obey a calendar year. It starts in like, you know, 
end of March or something like that, beginning of April. So the fiscal year, I think, goes beginning of April through to the end of March. And so the first nine months of the fiscal year that started last April, uh, the federal government has the biggest deficit they've ever had in their history. Okay, so the budgetary balance is a negative amount and a huge negative amount. And that means that the national debt of Canada has grown by several hundred billion dollars because the deficit being several hundred billion dollars means that the government had to borrow that amount of funds and the amount of national debt has grown. Okay? So again, that's where we're going. So let's repeat some of what we said, but make sure it's in our notes. Make sure it's there in writing. So fiscal policy refers to the government's choice on how much to spend on goods and services. So purchases of goods and services. That's the big G. How much taxes to levy? That's the big T. And how much transfers to allocate to agents? Okay? And taxes, purchases of goods and services, and transfers are highly linked with whether the government is borrowing or lending or doing neither. Government savings, highly connected to fiscal policy. So taxes are the income of the government. They levy all kinds of taxes. The kind of taxes include income taxes on people, corporate profit taxes, so kind of an income tax on a corporation, sales taxes, gasoline sales taxes, cigarette sales taxes, alcohol sales taxes, the goods and services sales tax, the GST, and so on and so forth. Social insurance taxes. These are uh, called payroll taxes because they're tied to a company's payrolls. And so the social insurance taxes are things like the Canada Pension Plan contributions, employment insurance contributions. In, in Ontario, the employer health tax. These are all taxes levied by different levels of government that are directly tied to the amount of payroll a company pays to their workers. Uh, of course, there's other taxes like property taxes, where you pay a, a, a particular amount by owning a particular piece of property. Uh, other taxes might include things like estate taxes. When you die, your estate might pay some taxes on the transfer of your property to someone else. If you buy a property in Ontario, there are land transfer taxes. And if you buy a property in Toronto, you pay the provincial land transfer tax. You also pay the municipal or city land transfer tax as well. Okay? So taxes come in many, many different forms. And like I said, they are the income of the government. Okay? If we exclude the interest payment on government debt, then government spending comes in two main forms. Notice I said we ex we're excluding the interest owing or being paid on the government debt. Then government spending comes in two main forms. Government spending of goods and services, the big G in our model, and transfers. Let's come back here to point number one. Every period of time, the government does spend money on goods and services. The government buys goods and services out in the economy that they use to run the government. The government also produces goods and services and freely gives them away to us sometimes. Transfers are payments that are being made to households for which the government is not receiving back something in, in return. So they're payments to households for which no good or service is provided to the government in return for those monies. You just get those monies because the government decided that they feel you need the money. So examples of transfers are things like public pension payments. You get your Canada Pension Plan payments or your Quebec Pension Plan payments. Old Age Security, OAS, and the Guaranteed Income Supplement are payments being made to certain seniors to make sure that they're not living in poverty, that they have some funds to uh, be able to make a, make, make a, a way in their life. Uh, child care benefits, 
uh, families with children under certain ages receive some transfers for every child they have you know, under a particular age. I think uh, the transfer is larger when the child is under six or six and under, and then it, it shrinks in size once they've uh, passed the age of six, but you keep getting the smaller transfer until the child reaches like 16 or 18 or something like that. Okay. Uh, employment insurance. Those are transfers from the government that go to some unemployed individuals, but the government is not receiving something back in return. They're just helping out those unemployed individuals so that they have some funds to soften the blow of their spell of unemployment. Okay? I'll also remind you of how government spending on goods and services directly enters into the total spending in the economy equation called the national income identity. GDP equals private sector consumption C plus investment spending plus government spending on goods and services plus exports minus imports. And that of course gives us our planned expenditure line when that's planned investment. Okay? And so the government's fiscal policy, the government's budgetary choices over government spending on goods and services, G, we can see it right there directly, over taxes, which enters this equation through the consumption function, and over transfers, which also enters this function, uh, this equation through the consumption function. Okay. Fiscal policy has an influence on our national income identity. And what you'll notice is fiscal policy enters ag expenditure here in two ways. It enters directly, G is there directly, so government uh, spending affects ag expenditure directly, right, right there. Because when the government decides to increase its spending on final goods and services, big G, by a billion, then planned expenditure just went up by a billion. That's a direct effect. There's also an indirect effect. The government budgetary balance has an indirect effect here on aggregate expenditure because changes in taxes and transfers, as we already acknowledged, enter in the consumption function. So by changing taxes and transfers, the government changes disposable income. I want you to remember that disposable income, why D, D for disposable, is the income that the uh, economy has after taxes and transfers have taken their, their, their course. So you take the aggregate income, subtract the, tans uh, the, the taxes, so that's the after-tax income, and you add the transfers, that's the after-tax and transfer income. Remember, if you think of the economy, the aggregate income is the income of the entire nation, the entire economy. But we pay our taxes like loyal citizens do. There's our after-tax income, but the government gives us back some transfers, and we add that in, and now we arrive at our disposable income. The amount of income we have at our disposal to buy stuff after paying our taxes and receiving our transfers. And so a change in disposable income, change here, that's a delta means change, a change in disposable income results in a change in consumption because the consumption function just depends on disposable income. We usually assume that private sector consumption C is a positive function of disposable income. That we write down a consumption function, something like this. Consumption equals autonomous consumption plus the marginal pence you consume times disposable income. Yes, that's a plus. Autonomous consumption, you, you may recall, is a positive constant. So is the marginal propensity to consume. It's a positive number less than one. And remember, disposable income is our income after taxes and adding our transfers. Okay? So... Uh, change 
in T or TR causes a change in YD. So change one of those, change taxes or transfers, disposable income changes. And as a result, that causes a change in consumption. If we increase taxes, let it taxes enter negatively, then disposable income drops. And that means the consumption would drop because of the positive marginal expense to consume. Similarly, if we cut transfers, transfers enter with a positive. If transfers drop, disposable income would drop, and consumption would drop again due to the positive. Oops, cut transfers. I got to look at the screen, Jack. Cut transfers, disposable income drops, consumption drops again because of the positive marginal propensity to consume. This is that indirect effect. A change of T or TR altering disposable income, thereby altering consumption, and thus in turn, altering planned aggregate expenditure, because C is changing. Okay? So that's, again, the so-called indirect effect. Right? By changing taxes or transfers, the government changes disposable income, change in disposable income results in a change of C, and a change of C, a change in planned expenditure. Okay? I will also acknowledge that a change of taxes may also influence investment spending if it impacts the profitability of investment projects. If investment projects become more profitable, then investment will rise. If investment projects become less profitable, investment will fall. An example of something like that would be a very special kind of tax, not just a, a regular tax. So, for example, in Alberta, there's a, a very large uh, set of deposits of hydrocarbons in the ground um, in various forms. Some of it is in the form of coal, some of it's in the form of natural gas or petroleum, but some of it is in the form of what are called uh, uh, oil sands. When I was younger, we called them tar sands, but they've sort of whitewashed it or greenwashed it to make it sound cleaner by calling it oil sands. And so imagine the provincial government of Alberta. One of the taxes they levy is they charge the resource companies a royalty. They charge them a certain amount of uh, uh, a tax, a royalty, for every barrel of uh, petroleum they produce. Well, they could increase that tax. They could say every barrel of petroleum that you pull out of the ground, whether it be from a regular oil well or from the oil sands, we're going to charge you a tax of $20 a barrel. Well, that tax makes the return on the investment in the oil fields lower because the government's taking a piece of the action. The world oil market determines what a, uh, a barrel of oil will go for, what it will sell for, and the government says, yeah, and I want $20 Canadian of that in the form of taxes. Oh, my goodness. And so that change of taxes makes investment in the oil field less profitable, and the oil firms would invest in fewer expansions or new capital in, in the oil fields, and therefore less oil would end up getting extracted, and maybe that's good for the environment. But that's, uh, that's another matter. Okay? So the implication here is a change in fiscal policy impacts the planned expenditure line. Both the whole line will shift and the AD curve will shift. And therefore, there will be changes in the short run level of output. Okay? So let me sneak back here.
Let me grab my ruler. And you may recall, of course, the 45 degree line is where income equals expenditure. Maybe beside this, I draw the income aggregate price level picture where we're going to get our aggregate demand curve. And imagine initially, there's our planned expenditure line. resulting in Y star zero being our equilibrium. When we draw this line, we're holding frozen a whole bunch of things, autonomous consumption, the interest rate, the aggregate price level, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The aggregate price level is being held fixed. It's one price level along here. And so, you know, maybe our AD curve looks like this. Maybe we're already in long run equilibrium. So there's our long run aggregate supply. And imagine there's our short run aggregate supply. These are initial curves, AD0 for our initial AD curve, SRAS0, our initial short run aggregate supply curve, and our initial long run aggregate supply curve. And imagine that price level is the price level buried inside of here. And Y star zero is the full employment level of GDP. Hooray. If G goes up, the plan expenditure line shifts up. It's a parallel shift. There's an increase in autonomous aggregate expenditure. Oops. What an S there. Then I want the up. So autonomous expenditure rises because of the higher G. The planned expenditure line shifts up. And at any price, that means the 80 curve also shifts up and over to the right. Point A was our initial long run equilibrium following the shift. Where we're now on 81, point B is our new short run equilibrium. Y has gone up. to Y star short run. P has gone up to P short run. And unemployment is down. There's more jobs to make this more uh, greater level of output. So that's that increase of G is called expansionary fiscal policy because we've expanded the size of the economy. Real GDP went up. We've expanded employment and reduced the unemployment rate. And so we pumped up the size of the economy. Of course, an increase of G will make this kind of shift. So will a tax cut. <laughs> 
and so will an increase of transfers. An increase of transfers, so that's an arrow upwards. That's the TR for transfers. A tax cut. Remember, taxes enter negatively. Or an increase of G. Plan expenditure line shifts up. AD shifts up and over the right. And the economy has expanded. Expansionary fiscal policy. And that's exactly what the slide said. Changes in fiscal policy influence the plan expenditure line. Both the plan expenditure line, AD, AD curve shift, and the short run level of output is impacted. Now let's take a look at the multiplier. So now we're going to formally alter the model to incorporate fiscal policy more explicitly in the income expenditure model, which we know is tied into the aggregate demand curve. So our assumptions for the income expenditure model continue to be very similar to what we've seen before. Producers are willing to supply additional output at a fixed price. Any change in aggregate expenditure results in a change in real GDP because prices are fixed right now. Right? The interest rate is held frozen along the plan expenditure line. Imports and exports are exogenous. They're determined autonomously. Right now, they're not tied to anything else. And here comes a more explicit dealing with fiscal policy. We'll still say that government spending of goods and services is just big G, a constant determined by the government. But here's the change. Taxes, big T for taxes, will now say equals T0, autonomous or lump sum taxes, plus little t times y. Well, little t is a positive fraction. An income tax rate. Okay, so it's the tax rate. So now the government decides the tax rate, little t. They also decide T0. Similarly, transfers. Big TR is government transfers. TR0 is autonomous or lump sum transfers. Those are transfers not linked to income. Just like T0 up there are taxes not linked to income. But we got minus little TR is a positive fraction. It, so it plays the same role that little t played up here. It's a transfer benefit reduction rate, sometimes called a clawback. Earlier, when I discussed the, uh, the payments made to parents of young children, uh, I sort of paused for a moment and said, I think it's six and under. I don't remember for sure, because my kids are older. And then it ends later on when they're 16 or 18 or something like that, and I don't know for sure. Well, why not, even though my kids are older? Because my family didn't qualify because my income was too high. The government decides sometimes for these benefit programs that not everybody gets the benefit. Some transfers are paid out to everybody universally, but some transfers get reduced by what's referred to as a clawback or transfer reduction rate. As the income rises, the amount of transfers you receive tend to fall. Okay, So there you go, taxes positively linked to income, transfers negatively linked to income because little tr there is a positive number but there's a minus one in front so as your income rises transfers drop the introduction of this little t and this little tr alter the way that fiscal policy works and this is now hardwired right into the economy it's hardwired right into the government's rules and this helps create this automatic stabilizer that i spoke of earlier If I get a big pay raise at the university, the Human Resources Department automatically recalculates how much tax to deduct every payroll 
and send to the government. If I'm earning a bigger income, if it's big enough and I move to another tax bracket, they take more off of my paycheck. That little T kicks in and I start paying more taxes because my income went up. Similarly, if my income went up, I could, the government sees that on my income tax return, they start giving me less transfers. So as income rises or falls, the amount of taxes collected or transfers doled out move around. And that helps to automatically stabilize the economy in the face of economic fluctuations. Well, let's take a look at planned expenditure. Here's the generic formulas. Consumption function didn't change. The investment function didn't change. G didn't change. Autonomous imports and exports. The changes here, the new terms, are how we write down taxes and transfers. That's why they're circled there. And here's a numerical example. Maybe there's our consumption function. That means that autonomous consumption is 600. The marginal propensity to consume is 75%. Autonomous taxes, 120. The tax rate, 15%. Autonomous transfers, 400. The clawback rate, 5%. Previously, little tr and little t were both zero. Taxes and transfers were just numbers. There was no additional terms. Planned investment, autonomous investment, 700. The nominal interest rate sensitivity investment, 5,000. Little i is the nominal rate of interest, written down in decimal point. So 0 0.02 means 2%, and that's a fixed interest rate. G is fixed in our numerical example, 500. Exports fixed at 280. Imports fixed at 250. In generic terms, go back to the generic formula, the plan expenditure line, you put C plus I plus G plus X minus imports, and you plug in taxes and transfers into the consumption function, and you get this very complex looking formula. This is the consumption function. Autonomous consumption plus MPC times disposable income. Plan investment function, remember planned. Plan investment function, G, X, and imports. Now we plug in, in the place of T, the formula for taxes. And in the place of TR, the formula for transfers. And it gets even scarier looking. Rearranging, we've got the planned aggregate expenditure equals autonomous consumption plus the marginal pensy consume collecting all the terms involving that guy, times one, sorry, times all this stuff. Inside the brackets, we've got one minus little t minus tr times y minus autonomous taxes plus autonomous transfers. And then continues autonomous investment, blah, 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 blah. Oh boy, kind of scary, right? Uh, rearranging, collecting all the terms not involving MPC and little t and little tr and y, all that other stuff is autonomous aggregate expenditure. Planned aggregate expenditure equals autonomous aggregate expenditure plus MPC times something times y. Remember, this is the slope of that upward sloping planned expenditure line. Previously, we just had this here times y. We didn't have this term, but it's because we got these new guys it alters the slope, okay? Of course, equilibrium is where income equals expenditure. And so y equals da 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 da, right? Well, when you do that, you end up with y equals autonomous aggregate expenditure times the multiplier. The multiplier used to be 1 over 1 minus MPC. But now the multiplier is 1 over 1 minus MPC times 1 minus taxes, ta sorry, the tax rate minus the transfer rate, or transfer clawback rate. That new little t and little tr hang around here. These guys have altered the slope of the planned investment line. They also altered the multiplier. So equilibrium Y is always autonomous aggregate expenditure 
times the multiplier, m for multiplier. Let's do our normal, you know, recipe. Solve for equilibrium using the numbers. By the numbers, I mean all these numbers here. All these guys. Don't use the generic. That's kind of scary. So the first step we always want to find, disposable income as a function of y. So disposable income, y minus taxes plus transfers. Y, plug in the tax function. So y minus t, 120 plus 15% of y, being subtracted, plus transfers. 400 minus 5% of y. Oh, okay. That's y times 1. That's a minus 15% of y. And this is another minus 5% of y. I've got minus 120 plus 400. So 400 take away 120, I get 280. But remember what we mentioned before. Use your calculator. Don't just try and eyeball everything. And of course, one take away, well, this is 20%, is 80%. So disposable income equals 280 plus 80% of Y. Step two, express the consumption function as a function of Y. Well, our consumption function is 600 plus 75% of disposable income. 600 plus 75% of disposable income. And now we plug in what we know disposable income is. Oh, right there, 75% times 280 plus 80% of Y. 75% of 0 0.8 is 0 0.6. But again, use your calculator. Don't just trust me. I've got 600 plus 75% of 280 we get 810, plus 75% of 0.8 times y gives us 0.6 times y. That's our new consumption function. Plan expenditure line, plug in the consumption function we just derived, plug in the planned investment line with the fixed interest rate of 2%, plug in the g, plug in the x, minus the imports, and calculate away. Planned aggregate expenditure equals 1,940 plus 60% of Y. Now solve for the equilibrium. Set Y equal to this. Oh, well Y equals 1,940 plus 60% of Y. When I take this 60% of Y over to this side, I now have 40% of Y, because I have to subtract it when I take it over to the left-hand side. 40% of Y equals 1,940. The equilibrium y equals 1940 divided by 0.4. Of course, that's 1940 times 2.5. And, and the answer is 4,850. The multiplier is the change in y star as you change, right? the change in the equilibrium income as you change autonomous investment. And that's 1 over 0.4. Remember, y star is always autonomous aggregate expenditure times the multiplier. Autonomous aggregate expenditure is the 1940. So that's 1940. 1 over 0.4 then is the multiplier. The multiplier is 2.5. A multiplier of 2.5 means that if g went up by 1 billions, right? Think about it. If G rose by 1 billion, then the planned expenditure line would shift up. Autonomous aggregate expenditure would rise by 1 billion. And Y star would rise by 2.5 times that, by 2.5 billions. Okay? So let's see that multiplier effect in, in play. So suppose the government increases its spending on goods and services by 50. 
we can find the new planned expenditure line and solve for the new Y star. We know the curve has shifted up. Autonomous aggregate expenditure jumped by 50 because autonomous aggregate expenditure includes G. And so when G goes up by 50, when this guy rises by 50, and all the rest here are all frozen, autonomous aggregate expenditure rises by 50. So the whole planned expenditure line jumped. Same slope, but it's now 50 units higher on the vertical axis. It used to have an intercept in 1940. Now the intercept is 1940 plus 50. The slope is still 0.6. So the planned expenditure line, 1990 plus 60% of y equals planned expenditure. The new equilibrium is where y intersects the planned expenditure line, where that planned expenditure line crosses the 45 degree line. So y star equals 1990 plus 60% of y star. This equals y. Oh, take that 60% take that of y over to this side. We have to subtract it. 40% of y star equals 1990. Y star is, is, equals 1990 divided by 0. 0.4. We get 4,975 when you put, do that in your calculator. Y went up. Indeed, it should rise. And it rose by 125. But we should have known this was coming. Because when G rose by 50, autonomous aggregate expenditure rose by 50. And y will rise by 50 times the multiplier. 50 times the multiplier. The multiplier, remember, is 2 and a half. 50 times 2 and a half is 125. And that's our second route. Our second route to find the new y, say, oh, the change of y equals the change in autonomous aggregate expenditure times m. The change was 50. There's the multiplier. We plug in the MPC the tax rate, the transfer clawback rate, blah, da, 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 and we get the, the multiplier is 1 over 0. 0.4, or 2 and a half, and we do the math. We say, that's great. Y went up by 125, so the new Y is the initial one, 4,850, plus the increase, giving us a brand new Y of 4,975. Okay? So that's the direct impact of fiscal policy. G is directly there. Now let's talk about the indirect effect. Imagine we change transfers or taxes. And we're going to take a look at the, how this all plays out. How it still influences the economy, but not exactly the same. So suppose the government lowers lump sum taxes by 50. So the change of T0 is it dropped by 50? That's a tax. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Jeez. That's a tax cut. So initially, taxes were this, and now the autonomous tax term is 50 lower. And so taxes equal 70 plus 15% of income. Method one find the new planned expenditure line. OK. When taxes are cut, disposable income rises. And that pushes up consumption because we have a positive MPC. Consumption rises by minus MPC times the change of taxes. Remember, the change of taxes is negative. So we got minus MPC times the change of taxes. I got negative and negative. That's a positive amount. I get 3 quarters of 50. right? And so aggregate autonomous expenditure rises by 37 and a half units. Yes, we cut taxes by 50, and the planned expenditure line shifted up, but it did not shift up by 50. The fact that the change of taxes has the MPC, which is a fraction multiplied against it, right, means that yes, the 50 unit reduction in taxes meant a 50-unit increase in disposable income, but it meant the consumption rose by less than 50 because of that fraction. So consumption rose by 37.5 units, and that made autonomous ag expenditure rise by 37.5 units. So our new planned expenditure line, the intercept is now 1940 plus this 37.5 units. Oh, 1940 plus 37 and a half is 1977 and a half, 
the slope is still 0 0.6. Bring this over here, now this becomes 0.4. Divide both sides by 0.4. The new equilibrium level of output is $4,943.75. Y went up by 93.75. Not 125, 93.75. You'll notice that this tax cut in some sense cost the government the same as the $50 change in G. When the government spends 50 more on goods and services, that means you know, they're, if they had a balanced budget, now they have a budget deficit of 50. Same idea here. If they had a bu balanced budget, but now they cut taxes by 50, now they have a budget deficit of 50. This gave a budget deficit of 50, but why would not buy 125? This gave a budget deficit of 50, and yet Y went up by only 93.75 because of the MPC. The role that MPC plays, that indirect route, matters. And remember, we can always take the shortcut route. We can use the multiplier to find the new Y. The change of Y equals the change in autonomous aggregate expenditure. So do this logic, find out what that is, 37.50 times the multiplier, 1 over 0.4. Y went up by 93.75. The new Y is the old one, plus 93 and 3 quarters, giving us $4,943.75 is our new Y. Okay? So what we're acknowledging here is when taxes drop by 50, the overall impact on Y is smaller than in the case when G went up by 50. And it's because a change in taxes influences autonomous aggregate expenditure indirectly through disposable income and the consumption function. And that's where it picks up that multiply by MPC term right? and softens the blow. A change in G, though, enters directly. There's no times MPC. G enters with a coefficient of 1 in front of it, not a fractional coefficient. I will also acknowledge that you get the same result as we just saw here if the government increases transfers to households by 50. Because if transfers rise by 50, then disposable income goes up by 50. And if disposable income goes up by 50, consumption rises by 37.5. So again, if transfers go up by 50, consumption will rise by 37.5 because disposable income will rise by 50, but cons consumption itself will only rise by 37.5 because again, it picks up that times MPC, this time on the transfer term. So what we just saw then, when you think about it in terms of the multiplier, Having this tax rate term and this transfer clawback term alters the multiplier. Since taxes and government transfers automatically depend on income, they change automatically whenever income fluctuates. And that's how we get this automatic stabilizer. The introduction of this term here that's a positive fraction and that term there that's a positive fraction has lowered the size of the multiplier. The multiplier is now this. I'll remind you in our earlier numerical example, the tax rate was zero, the transfer clawback rate was zero, taxes and transfers were purely autonomous, we had the MPC of three quarters, and our multiplier was one over one minus MPC, and the multiplier was four. If G went up by 10 billion, then Y would go up by four times 10 billion, 40 billion. And now, with a tax rate of 15% and a transfer clawback rate of 5% and the same marginal pence to consume, now the multiplier, using this formula and plugging all those terms in, now the multiplier is this, and the multiplier is now 2.5. If G rises by 10 billion, then Y rises by 25 billion, 2.5 times 10 billion. For the same fluctuation of G, we have a smaller fluctuation of Y because we have a smaller multiplier.
So that positive tax rate and that positive transfer clawback rate are what are making the multiplier shrink. That's what's making the economy, the economy automatically stabilized. Remember the notion. The change in Y equals the change in autonomous aggregate expenditure times the multiplier. And if we have a smaller multiplier, then when this is fluctuating, Y is fluctuating less. So a smaller multiplier means that the equilibrium income, GDP, fluctuates less in the economy as aggregate expenditure itself changes. Whether this be a change due to a change in taxes or transfers or government spending of goods and services or a change coming from somewhere else that's not fiscal policy related, a change due to a change in autonomous consumption or autonomous investment, or the interest rate, or even you know the export sector or import sector. Okay. Why don't we take a short break? All right. So now we're going to talk about how effective fiscal policy is at changing why. Okay. We're going to talk about expansionary as well as contractionary fiscal policy. So we've already acknowledged or documented the changes in government spending of goods and services, G, changes in taxes, T0, and changes in transfers, TR0, result in changes in autonomous aggregate expenditure. That shifts the planned expenditure line and shifts the aggregate demand curve. So again, that shifts the planned expenditure line and AD curves. And that results in a change in GDP in the short run. We saw you know, examples like that earlier. If G went up, or transfers went up, or taxes were cut, the plant expenditure line shifts up because autonomous aggregate expenditure rises. So the plant expenditure line shifts up. The AD curve shifts over to the right. Y's gone up. Y's gone up. Point B is our brand new equilibrium. We've expanded the economy doing either of these three things. So so-called expansionary fiscal policy, bigger G, bigger transfers, lower taxes. Any of those three. Of course, contractionary fiscal policy, we shrink the size of the economy, so we're shrinking output. Well, we do the opposite of any of those three things. We cut government spending of goods and services, which shifts the planned expenditure line down and shifts the 80 curve down and lowers Y, lowers Y. Tax increases, same idea. Shifts the planned expenditure line down, shifts the aggregate demand curve down, lowers Y, lowers Y. Or a reduction in transfers. Shifting the planned expenditure line down, shifting the AD down, and again, decreasing the size of output in the short run. So maybe we want to use expansionary fiscal policy if we feel that output is small relative to what it should be or what we want it to be. And maybe we use contractionary fiscal uh, policy when we feel that output is too large relative to what we want it to be. So we can increase output if we think it's too small. We can reduce it if we feel it's too big. Uh, similarly, think about the analogy of driving an automobile. When you drive an automobile and you're driving along and, and the roadway is nice and clear, then you can drive at a nice steady speed. But if uh, you see some traffic coming up ahead, you might have to tap on the brakes and slow the car down. You might be viewing this the same idea as hitting the gas pedal or hitting the brakes. You might say the economy is growing too quickly. 
and so we might want to tap on the brakes and slow down the growth of the economy by using contractionary fiscal policy. Similarly, you might feel the economy is moving too slowly, it's growing too slowly, and you might want to step on the gas and increase GDP and increase its growth rates by using expansionary fiscal policy. Uh, we got a sort of a change of direction here, and now we ask a very interesting question. Okay, in theory, that's what fiscal policy does or how it works, but can it actually work? Right? Last week, for example, we talked about how we can use fiscal policy to close a recessionary gap. However, not everybody believes that fiscal policy actually will smooth out business cycles. Notice I said not everybody. A lot of people do believe it, but some are in denial. So let's talk about some of the various claims out there and you know, why people might criticize how or why fiscal policy does or does not work. So claim number one, government spending always, that's a strong word, that's why I heavily underline that, you know, government spending always crowds out private spending. Crowds out means, you know, pushes it out away. So here's the argument. Every dollar the government spends is a dollar that they take away from the private sector. And so any increase in government spending must be offset by an equal reduction in private spending. Uh, again, that's the argument. The counter argument is this. This earlier argument is only true if the economy is operating at full employment, if it's operating at the long run equilibrium level of GDP. I'll remind you that YFE, the full employment level of GDP, is determined by inputs, physical capital, labor, and human capital, and technology, A and F. And if we feel that the physical stock of capital is fixed, labor is fixed, human capital is fixed, the technology is fixed, then everything on the right-hand side is fixed, YFE is a fixed amount. And that's why our long-run supply curve is vertical at one fixed level of GDP. And so if inputs and technology are fixed, the long-run equilibrium level of GDP is fixed, and according to the argument then put forward in this earlier bullet point, if I increase G by 10 billion and Y is fixed, then that means that C plus I plus X minus imports has to decline by 10 billion because if this side is fixed, that side overall has to be fixed. A dollar more spending by the government means a dollar less by the private sector. If this is a $10 billion increase here, then C plus I plus X minus imports has to drop by exactly $10 billion to keep YFE fixed. But this claim is only true in long run equilibrium. Okay? And that's why we go, however, if the economy's got a recessionary gap, then expansionary fiscal policy actually does work. Okay? So this kind of claim is only true in a very, very particular environment. And in fact, go back to the picture I drew earlier today. This one. We started in long run equilibrium on an increased G, and bam, we expanded the economy. The way I drew this picture, the way I told the story, I have drawn this picture and told this story under the assumption that this claim is not true. That I can force the economy away from long run equilibrium using fiscal policy. Okay? All right. Claim number two. Government borrowing, always, there's that strong word again, crowds out private investment spending. And the argument goes something like this, expansionary fiscal policy lowers savings by the public sector, government savings. And if government savings drops, the supply of loanable funds drops. And that puts upward pressure on, on the interest rate, and that crowds out investment. That's that crowding out effect that we spoke about in the past. Okay? So again, expansionary fiscal policy lowers government savings, 
that lowers national savings and that reduces the supply of funds. So F for funds, S for supply. And if you reduce the supply of funds, that puts upward pressure on the interest rate and crowds out investment spending. What we just described is something like this. If I undertake expansionary fiscal policy, Remember, expansionary fiscal policy is either an increase of G or a tax reduction or an increase of transfers. That reduces government savings. And that, in turn, lowers the supply of funds. The supply of funds curve shifts over to the left. And that pushes up the equilibrium interest rate. And that lowers investment spending. That's the demand for funds. Less funds are going to be exchanged. Less investment is going to happen. That's, of course, our friend there, claim number two. How do I know that government savings drops? Remember, savings by the government is the income of the government minus the government spending on goods and services minus the transfers. Okay? If you cut taxes, you're cutting government savings. That's dropping. If you're increasing G, which enters negatively, that goes up, this goes down. If you're increasing transfers, which enters negatively, transfers go up, government savings goes down. We get a lot of mileage out of just remembering this definition. The government savings, the income of the government taxes, minus the current spending by the government. Government spending of goods and services and transfers being subtracted out. So that if any of these three happen, government savings drops, and national savings is private savings plus government savings. And so if government savings drops, this guy drops, then national savings drops, and that's the supply of funds. Okay. We know that pushes up the interest rate, and keep in mind that investment spending equals autonomous investment minus D times I, where D is a positive constant, and autonomous investment is a positive constant. So if the interest rate rises, investment drops. So remembering these other facts helps us to deal with this claim. So that's the claim here. Let's talk about the counter-argument. The crowding out on investment is less likely to happen if the economy has a recessionary gap. An expansionary fiscal policy pushes up income, pushes up output, Right? Given households only consume a portion of the increase of income, you have to sneak that in there, national savings would actually rise and the interest rate wouldn't increase as much. Remember, if income rises, we save a portion of the income increase and we consume the rest. And so since private savings rises a little bit when Y rises, that softens the blow here. Let me go back to the picture. When any of these things change in the manner we described here, government savings dropped. Pushing this guy this way, government savings dropped. But when Y rises, private savings rises, and that pushes that guy back a little bit. It softens the blow. The interest rate doesn't rise as much, and investment doesn't fall as much. That's what the counter-argument is saying. Claim number three. Government budget deficits result in a reduction in private spending. And the argument goes something like this. Holding everything else frozen, expansionary fiscal policy 
tends to result in a budget deficit. And if you already had a budget deficit, a bigger budget deficit. If you had a balanced budget, well, now you have a budget deficit. And in order to finance the budget deficit, the government borrows funds. They run up more debt. The stock of national debt increases. And so to pay off the debt in the future, the government has to increase taxes in the future. And so the argument behind this claim is that people anticipate an increase in taxes in the future. And because of that, households save more right now. And they spend less right now in orders that they're in good shape when the tax increase comes and they can afford that tax increase. In the strongest version of this argument, expansionary fiscal policy has no impact on output. This is called Ricardian equivalence. In that strong Ricardian equivalence world, remember y is equal to c plus i plus g plus x minus imports. In that strong Ricardian equivalence world, if we increase g by 10 billion, then consumption will fall by 10 billion. And therefore, overall, Y won't change. This expansionary fiscal policy doesn't expand the economy. That's what Ricardian equivalence says. G went up by 10 billion, C would drop by 10 billion, Y wouldn't change whatsoever. If you gave me a tax cut today, imagine we had a balanced budget this morning, and this afternoon the Prime Minister lowers everybody's taxes, and they cut taxes by $5 billion. Then instead of running out and spending more on consumption, the consumers are forward-looking and rational. And they say, oh, gee whiz, now we have a $5 billion budget deficit. The government had to borrow those funds. In the future, they have to pay back that fu those funds with interest. Oh, my gosh, they're going to have to raise my taxes in the future. I didn't really gain anything when they cut my taxes. I better just put it in the bank or put it in a bond, invest it in something, in, in a financial asset, because in the future, they're going to raise my taxes by $5 billion plus interest because we have to pay back that borrowing. That's what Ricardian equivalent says that the agents are forward-looking and that they're rational and they expect to repay any budget deficit today that became debt sometime in the future. Okay? The counter-argument goes something like this. It's unlikely that we get full Ricardian equivalence. It's unlikely that households behave in such extreme manner that they have such great foresight and budgeting discipline when you cut somebody's taxes and they have more money in their bank account, they're more likely to spend some of that. Come on. And so even if they do have some for, uh, uh, foresight, they might spread out the reduction in consumption, not you know, just today, but they might spread it over multiple periods. They might say, yeah, G went up by $10 billion this period, but we're not going to cut consumption by a whole $10 billion today. We'll cut it by a portion of $10 billion this year, and another portion of it next year, and another portion the year after to spread out the pain. So it's easier to stomach this. Okay? So if you believe in the counter-argument, then we don't get this full equivalence. The increase of G would actually 
Yes, it would cause a deficit. Yes, it would increase the debt load, but it would also stimulate Y. Right? So therefore, fiscal policy can still increase output, but by a smaller amount. Because people are saying, oh, gee whiz, yeah, there will be a future tax increase. I better save a portion of that tax cut. I better prepare for the future. So fiscal policies become less effective, not completely ineffective, according to the counter-argument. Okay? All righty. Set those guys aside for a future scanning. When it comes to fiscal policy, there's some other things that kind of matter. And uh, it's a good idea for us to talk about some of these other things instead of just hiding from them. And one of them is lags. I pause for a minute. You can see the time lag. In the real world, fiscal policy can influence output, yay, but there are time lags, sometimes called policy lags. And that's the time between when the policy is decided upon and when it actually gets implemented. And so these lags can come in a various number of ways. I can think of at least three of them here. So if you're thinking about using fiscal policy to smooth out the business cycle, the first form that the policy lag takes is it takes time for the government to realize that the economy is actually hit by a shock. The data we get about employment and output come with a lag. The most current data is an estimate from the past. You know, the unemployment rate for the month of January, not the month of February yet, because the time lags. It takes time to collect and process information. And so it takes time for the government to realize that a shock has actually hit the economy, to realize there's a problem. How can you react to a problem if you don't even know it's there? Uh, number two, even when, the economy, uh, even when the government decided, okay, the economy has a problem, it takes time for the government to create a plan in order to respond to that shock. They have to decide, well, what's most appropriate? Should we change G? Should we change T? Should we change transfers? Should maybe we ask the central bank to use monetary policy instead? What is the best approach? But right now we're emphasizing fiscal policy. It also takes time for the fiscal policy to actually influence the economy. If this morning the prime minister uh, introduces uh, this brand new plan, the plan has to go to the House of Commons, has to go through three sets of votes, has to pass all those votes, has to go to the Senate and pass through debates there and get passed, then it has to go to the uh, Governor General to get signed. And I don't know how that works now that we kind of really have a lame duck Governor General. But anyway, it takes time for that plan to not only be framed, but it takes time for that plan to actually get put into law. But even, even if the, the, the law was passed this morning, right? We've gone through all those lags from the middle here, developing and passing that plan. And now today, the increase of G is happening. It takes time for that increase of G to spread through the economy. If there were tax cuts that started today, it takes time for that to filter out through the economy. And so it takes time for the change of fiscal policy to actually influence the economy, for that multiplier effect to happen. When we talked about GDP in the past, we said that one person's income right, turns around, gets spent, and becomes someone else's income. So one person's expenditure is someone else's income. So Jack gets a, 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 you know, a tax cut. It takes a while for that tax cut to be seen on my, on my payroll, but as soon as it is, then I go out and spend some more money, and someone else gets an increase of income because of that. And then someone else getting that more income goes out and spends more as well, and someone else gets an increase of income. That multiplier effect, that sort of snowballing, takes time as the, as the change of policy is filtered through the economy. So the implication of all this is, because of these policy and time lags, time to realize there's a problem, time to develop and pass a plan, and time for that plan to actually influence the economy, it's possible 
that by the time the change in fiscal policy is really having an effect on the economy, the shock might already be over. It's kind of like saying, you know, I, in the middle of the night, and I wake up and go, I think I smell smoke. Right? Time to realize there's a problem. Right? I kind of wake up, uh, I think I smell, but I may go back to sleep, I'm just dreaming. Turns out one of my neighbor's houses is on fire. I'm just making this up, this is not reality. But it takes me a while to realize this is a problem when my neighbor's house is on fire. Then I'm like, you know, where's my phone? Right? Call in 911. Call 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, there's a fire in my neighborhood. I'm looking out the window and the house across the street is on fire. And they say, oh gosh, well, we've got to get a plan here. It's the fire brigade you need, okay. Where do you live? And they have to figure out what's the closest fire brigade that it isn't already occupied in order to send them. Right? By the time they arrive, though, the fire may already be over. If there's enough of a lag here, hopefully, that doesn't mean the house burned to the ground. Hopefully it means that the person just put it out on their own. Right? So in terms of this fiscal policy, because of the length of all these lags cumulatively, they, you remember each one lumps on top of each other, it's possible by the time the policy is actually out there really having its, its impact, the problem's already over. Right? If this is the case, that this actually happened, then the changes in fiscal policy have resulted in extra unnecessary fluctuations in output. The policy that we meant to use to smooth out the fluctuation of output has actually created additional fluctuations. Oh boy. Remember, most of today's lecture has been emphasizing how fiscal policy works and how it can influence the economy in the short run. But if you're using fiscal policy to try and smooth out short-run fluctuations, and it itself is creating short-run fluctuations, wow, it's really part of the problem instead of the cure sometimes. All righty. Let's go back and talk about government savings. The so-called budget balance. So we're going to look at the causes and consequences of budget surpluses and budget deficits. And you might use the budgetary balance as, a, as an indicator of fiscal policy. It's not a perfect indicator. You could use it as such, but it's not necessarily. So I'll remind you that government savings or public savings, as for savings, public, or the government budget balance, GBB, government budget balance, is the income of the government minus its current spending on transfers and on goods and services. So although the budget balance changes whenever there's a change in fiscal policy, a change of T or a change of TR or a change of G, those are changes of fiscal policy, they alter the budgetary balance. Right? So although the budget balance will change whenever there's a change in fiscal policy, we can't just use the budget balance to look at the stance of fiscal policy. Just because the government budget balance is getting bigger or smaller, doesn't mean that we're doing contractionary or fiscal policy. Right? Uh, the reason why you can't just use this, why the budgetary balance is misleading, is it's possible for these numbers here to change, even without a deliberate change of fiscal policy. I'll remind you in our algebraic model we had earlier today, tax revenue could be a function of why. Transfers could be a function of why. And so it could be that why changed. That's the business cycle. Making tax revenue change, making transfer payments change, making the budgetary balance change, but there was no change in the stance of fiscal policy. Okay, That's why we can't use the budgetary balance purely as an indicator of fiscal policy. A change of the budget balance could come from a change of why. So let's talk about that business cycle and something called the cyclically adjusted budgetary balance. So again, budgetary balance, government budget balance, T minus transfers minus G, plug in the tax expression, plug in the transfer expression, subtract out G, there's the government budgetary balance. And there's that dependence on Y we spoke about earlier. 
If Y fluctuates, the budgetary balance fluctuates. That's a positive number, that's a positive number. So if Y rises, the budgetary balance rises. The government saves more. Right? Why do they save more? Because when Y goes up, tax revenue goes up. And when Y goes up, transfer payments go down, saving the government some funds. So again, an increase of real GDP improves the budgetary balance. A decrease of real GDP causes the budgetary balance to erode. The automatic stabilizers kick in. When Y drops, when Y drops, we get a tax cut automatically. When Y drops, we get an increase of transfers automatically. That's the automatic stabilizer of the tax and transfer system. So the gov government budgetary balance will change whenever there's a deliberate change in fiscal policy, a deliberate change of T, the T0, or of TR0, transfers, or of G. A deliberate change of fiscal policy will make the budgetary balance change. For our purposes within this course, we're going to pretend the tax rate, little t, and the transfer clawback rate are fixed constants. But we could always use fiscal policy to change those also if we so desired. So again, a change in G, T, or TR influence the government budgetary balance. And it does so two ways. The direct impact, we can see it, because it's change of G, there it is, it's changing that right away. A change of T0 or TR0, there it is, it affects this right away, that's the direct effect. But there's also an indirect effect, because a change of G or taxes or transfers will shift the plan expenditure line shift the AD curve, and it'll make Y change in the short run. And if Y changes, the budgetary balance changes also. That's the indirect effect. So there's an indirect change, because the change of those guys changes Y, which alters the amount of taxes collected and transfers sent out, and that alters the budgetary balance. Since the budget balance changes automatically when Y changes, part of the budget balance is endogenous. It's being determined while Y is being determined. Because the budget balance itself is a function of Y. If Y is being determined in our model, then so is the budget balance. Given T0, TR0, G, little t, and little tr. Ooh. That also means that we need to be very clear and have a distinction between a deficit during a recession from what's called a, a persistent or structural deficit. That's a deficit that happens even when the economy is back at YFE, back at full employment. So a persistent deficit that hangs around even though we're in long-run equilibrium is called a structural deficit. The government's running a deficit, a budgetary deficit, even though Y equals YFE. And that's bad for the economy. Uh, I don't know how much you're following the current events in the Canadian economy, but as I mentioned, in the first nine months of this year, uh, the, this fiscal year, the federal government has run the largest budget deficit in the history of Canada in the first nine months. And my, most people go, oh, but you know, it's COVID, you know, it's okay, it's not a big deal. But remember, they gotta pay that back in the future. That's, that's one problem, that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, the parliamentary budget officer has warned that the size of government programs and whatnot are such that the parliamentary budget officer of Canada believes that we have a structural deficit. That even when the economy gets past COVID and goes back to YFE, the parliamentary budget officer of Canada feels that there's still gonna be a budget deficit even when we're in full employment. We're gonna have a structural deficit and I forget the number that they, they pushed around or, or, or gave, but it was something on the order of about 30 billion. And you might go, well, why is that bad? Well, that's 30 billion the government needs to borrow even in long run equilibrium every year. Put another way, that's 30 billion that they can't use to spend on other things, like programs to help children, or 
uh, subsidies to reduce tuitions at the post-secondary education, or uh, subsidies to uh, make uh, access to medical care easier or, or, or more widespread, or to help Aboriginals and, and, and other disadvantaged groups. Okay? A cyclical deficit, right? And a structural deficit. We're di distinguishing between the two, right? The, the, when the government budget balance is equal to zero when the, when the economy's in long run equilibrium, and the government runs an occasional budget deficit when the economy's in a recessionary gap, that's the normal situation. We have a deficit that is due to the business cycle. But when we're back in long run equilibrium, the budget is balanced or close to being balanced. That's more usual. So ideally, the government should be running surpluses when Y is above YFE and deficits during negative times when Y is below YFE in such a manner that the budget is balanced over time when Y is equal to YFE on average. Why is it bad to have a structural deficit? I already mentioned some things about how if you're spending the money on, you know, on borrowing costs, it means less to spend on education, less to spend on children, less to spend on you know, post-secondary edu uh, education subsidies or medical care or whatever. Right? And so looking at the longer term, we want to take a look at the longer term implications of fiscal policy. We have to look at the connection between the budget balance and national debt. So the budget balance talks about the surplus or deficit. The debt is the accumulation of all the past borrowing. So there's a, a close relationship between the budget balance today and the national debt today. The national debt at time t equals the national debt at time t minus 1 minus the government budget balance at time t. If we have exactly a balanced budget, this is 0 and the debt at the end of time t is the same as the debt at the end of the previous period. The amount of debt is neither growing nor is it shrinking if we have a budget balance that is exactly balanced because this is zero. If we're running a budget deficit, then the national debt at time t is the national debt at time t minus one minus something negative. Because remember, a budget deficit means this is a negative term. Negative, negative means that we'd be adding. So when you're running a budget deficit, the national debt of the country is growing. So when you're running a budget deficit, the government budget balance is negative. We've got negative, negative, and the national debt is rising. Of course, if you're running a budget surplus, this is positive, and that means the national debt from the previous period, we can pay some of it off using the surplus. If we had a $50 billion surplus, then the debt at time t is $50 billion lower than it was at time t minus 1 after we've used the surplus to buy down the debt. Okay? So again, balanced budget. The debt is neither rising nor falling. Budget deficit, the debt is growing. Budget surplus, the debt is falling. The change in the debt is the difference in the debt at time t and the debt the year before. And that's minus the government budget balance. That's minus that guy. Because the change is this minus that guy. We bring it over the other side. It leaves behind minus GBB. Again, balanced budget, that guy zero. The change in the debt, zero. Budget surplus, this guy's positive, and the debt is actually shrinking. Because you get a minus times a positive number, and, and the national debt is actually falling. What does this look like for Canada? Well, this isn't the most recent data, but here, let's take a look at some figures. So this is time, and you'll notice the actual budget deficit in red, and the cyclically adjusted budget deficit in orange. You'll also notice this shaded period here, this shaded period here, and this shaded period there, those are recessions. A recession in the early 80s, another one in the early 90s, another one in 2008-9 here in Canada. And you'll notice during periods of recession, you'll notice the actual budget deficit grew thanks to that recession. 
right? The actual budget deficit grew thanks to this recession. The actual budget deficit grew because of that recession. The recession means that GDP has shrunk in real terms. That means employment has shrunk and unemployment rose, it ballooned. And that meant that there's more transfer payments from the government to unemployed individuals. That meant that there, the government may have responded by cutting taxes or increasing G. It depends on, you know, back here, they increased government spending, they cut taxes, and they increased transfer payments. And that's why that guy shot up so much. Right? They did less of that in each of these other recessions. This one, it was just a bad period. Okay? Now let's move this one slide forward. So on this side of the diagram, we have debt to GDP ratio. Okay? And on this side of the diagram, we have the budget balance as a percentage of GDP. And you'll notice zero is in the middle of the picture on this axis. So here's a balanced budget. Deficit, surplus. So there's the government budget balance. Deficit, all these periods. And look what happens to the debt to GDP ratio. It's rising. Bigger deficit, faster increase. You'll notice we got into a surplus here into the 1990s. So in the mid-1990s, we, we balance the budget, we go into surplus, and the debt to GDP ratio is dropping. That's that, that algebra we saw earlier. That a deficit adds to the debt, and surpluses pull it down. Okay. And here's net debt to GDP from about 10 years ago. And you'll notice that Canada's down here at about 60%. Japan, 150%. Italy, 113%. Our friends in the United States, 100%. I can just imagine what these numbers look like in a year or two, thanks to all the COVID situation. Uh, you'll also notice Norway has net debt to GDP that's actually negative. Uh, Norway doesn't have debt, they have assets. Because Norway has... Uh, one very, very valuable asset, oil. And also, uh, the government of Norway said, well, we got a lot of oil and very few people, and so rather than spend all the money we made from the oil, we're going to put a bunch of it aside. We're going to invest it for the future on behalf of all Norwegian citizens because they deserve to have this endowment so that in the future, when the oil's gone or we no longer use oil, we'll still be able to have a good standard of living. Okay? All righty. Now let's go back to our friend, Mr. Doc Cam. So that's the pics we just saw. Okay? I'm just looking for the ordering here so I can put them back together. Okay. So now we're going to talk about some problems related to that rising government debt. Imagine you're running a lot of deficits and the government is, is not able to get them under control. The public, the, us citizens, us voters should be concerned about the stance of fiscal policy when the government debt is growing. Persistent budget deficits do crowd out investment. And that reduces the long-run economic growth in the economy. Structural deficits lower public savings. That shifts the supply of funds curve over to the left. And that forces up the interest rate from the initial equilibrium to the new one. And that lowers the amount of investment. So investment is crowded out by these deficits, if this is persistent. If the investment is crowded out, that means the amount of capital at time t plus 1 is, is dropping 
relative to what it would have been. Because capital at time t plus 1 equals capital at time t plus any investment at time t. Investment is the spending of uh, funds to build brand new capital and to repair and maintain capital and keep it in service. So if investment spending is dropping at time t, that means capital at time t plus 1 is dropping relative to what it could have been or would have been everything else the same. If we have less capital, we know that means less output being produced because of the positive marginal productivity of capital. And so again, less capital means less output in long run equilibrium. If we have these structural deficits, we can have less GDP in long run equilibrium. And when we carve that up and say, here's your portion of the GDP, here's your portion, if there's the same number of us as individuals, if there's less aggregate GDP and the same number of mouths to feed, then that means less per capita, less per person. Uh, similarly, or on top of this, if capital is not growing as quickly, that's the growth rate of capital. Remember the growth accounting? The growth rate of real GDP equals the growth rate of total factor productivity plus capital's income share times the growth rate of capital plus labor's income share times the growth rate of human capital. Right? And so this is talking about the growth rate of output per person, capital per person, human capital. If the growth rate of capital per person drops, then the growth rate of income per person drops. We have less aggregate income. We've got less income per, per worker. These things aren't so great. This is why we should care. We could be borrowing to have a wonderful party today, but we've mortgaged our future. However, there is a bit of a pushback here. If the budget deficits are due to spending on public investment in things like education and infrastructure, on things that will push up human capital, that'll push up physical capital, that's infrastructure, right? then this may be less of a problem. Right? Because it means bigger total factor productivity, a bigger A. Because we've invested in education, we've invested in innovation, we've invested in new physical capital, new human capital. So we could have a bigger A, a bigger total factor productivity growth. If total factor productivity growth goes up, the growth of output per worker goes up. So don't just say, oh my gosh, the sky's falling. Ask, what are we spending the funds on? On a related note, it's like going to the, the bank. You go to the bank and you ask the banker, can I borrow $500,000? They look at you and they say, what are you going to do with it? If you lay out your plans of what you're going to do with it, and you say, well, I'm going to go on a big uh, you know, world tour, and I'm going to go to as many countries as I can before the money runs out, the banker's likely to say, forget it, I'm not giving you that loan because that's not productive. How are you going to pay us back? But if instead you say, I have this wonderful idea for a series of, uh, of blogs, uh, videos, uh, books, and other things about traveling and tourism, and I'm going to travel the world, and I'm going to write these blogs and books and all these kinds of things, and I'm going to have these videos, and I'm going to become uh, a celebrity on social media. I'm going to be selling my books and stuff on the internet and through you know, Amazon or eBay or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm going to really leverage this and I have this sort of novel idea about how I'm going to do this. The banker might look at you and say, wow, earlier when you just said, I want to borrow 500000 to travel the world and have fun, it sounded like you were going to have a party but weren't going to be able to pay me back. But now it sounds like you're investing in very productive things. They're going to earn you, uh, I think, uh, enough income that you're going to be able to pay back this loan, no problem, right? I'm really keen on making this loan to you. Right? Some investments, some borrowing is good. If we're just borrowing to, you know, if we're borrowing to pave Ottawa with bricks of gold, well, that's not very helpful. Right? Okay. We've already mentioned this, but it's worth repeating. Persistent budget deficits lead to the accumulation of more national debt. When the government borrows from the public to finance the deficit, the national debt grows. Uh, remember, the government needs to pay interest on the debt. And as the pile of debt gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the interest costs get bigger and bigger and bigger. 
and the money spent in the interest costs could have been used for something else. So these interest payments are eating up resources that could have went to other important programs. And that means maybe the government has to reduce services or increase taxes or perhaps both in order to be able to manage their finances. Alternatively, or as well, it's possible for the stock of debt to become completely unsustainable. It becomes so big that the government says, you know what, there's no way we can manage this, there's no way we can pay this back. We're going to default. We're going to tell everyone holding our debt, I'm sorry, I'm not paying you back. I went bankrupt. It might sound absurd, but it is possible for a government, if they so declare, to say that they're not going to honor their debt. This is called a sovereign debt crisis. This has happened in Argentina. This has happened in Mexico. This has happened in Russia. This has happened in Israel several times. This has happened in too many countries. Right? So we're going to want to talk about that default and debt in practice. How do you know when it's unsustainable? Well, one of the metrics that people use is a metric we already saw in our diagrams, the debt to GDP ratio. So to, a metric that we use to look at the burden of the national debt or the government's ability to pay back its debt is to look at the size of the national debt as a size, as a fraction of the GDP. In fact, when I first said that example about going to the banker and saying, can I borrow $500,000, I'm sure most of you thought, well, the banker's going to look at you and they're going to look at your bank accounts and decide on whether you're a good risk based on your credit rating, on how much money you have in your bank accounts, on your income and other flows through your accounts. If I want to borrow 500000 but I have a pension plan account at the bank that has 700000 in it, the banker might say, well, we've got collateral, right? If I have a home that's collateral, things like that, they might say, this person's safer, less of a risk. Well, same sort of notion here. The size of the debt as a percent of the annual economic income of the entire economy. The higher this ratio, then the more you tend to get alarmed. He says, going back to that bar chart we saw earlier. Look at those guys. In 2012, Japan owed a national debt of about 150% of GDP. They owed a year and a half's worth of GDP to pay back the debt. And that means even when the interest rate is low, you apply a low interest rate to a big number, you still get a fairly large number. So the carrying cost of that debt is high. Canada, on the other hand, was less than half the size of the debt. So it made our carrying costs lower, freed up those funds for other purposes. Okay. So the higher the debt to GDP ratio, the higher the burden of the national debt. One of the difficulties with using the debt to GDP ratio with these figures we see here is this came from the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Data like this that come from international sources, they collect it from national governments and they try and harmonize and make the, the data comparable from country to country, but is not always comparable. If this here is Canada's government net debt to GDP in 2012, what do you want to bet that this is only national debt, uh, federal government debt, and it ignores territories and provinces? If the territories and provinces are left out here, then that's not really a true picture of the amount of government debt in the country, is it? Because we've ignored some of the debt. It's kind of like saying to a person, how much do you owe? And they say, well, my, my car loan is 20000 you say, oh, so you owe 20000 Yeah. And then 20 minutes later, it comes out that they also have a student loan for 15000 And a half an hour later, it comes out that they have a mortgage. Ten minutes later, it comes out they have a credit card balance that they owe. And so some of this data, this is all, I, I presume, at least at the national level, but some of it may ignore lower levels of governments. And each country, of course, is unique. If in the United Kingdom, notice I said if, I didn't say I'm claiming this is the case. If in the United Kingdom, all the government debt is 
held at the national level, then this 69%, although it looks bigger than Canada's, right, could be all the government debt in the entire country. And if Canada's only national debt and ignores provincial debt and territorial debt and municipal debt, then this number is an underestimate of the total amount of net debt to GDP. And indeed, maybe when you add in the territories and provinces, Canada might actually do worse than the United Kingdom. So it's very difficult to compare countries unless the data has really been cleaned up and corrected and made comparable. Right? Uh, the province of Ontario has a very high net amount of debt. Right? But another problem becomes, even if all these are, all the levels of government, all their debts combined together, right? these, are, these are actual borrowings, you might also have implicit borrowings, implicit liabilities. Implicit liabilities refer to spending promises that are made by the government that are not that are effectively debt, but they're not really debt in, you know, we can see in the, in the borrowing markets. Right? So they're effectively debt, even though they're not included in the usual debt statistics. Uh, in Canada, examples of implicit liabilities are things like the federal government has transfers to lower level governments, like the Canada Health Transfer, or the old age security transfers to people. Right? They call it OAS, or old age security. Or the Canada Social Transfer, again, transfer from the federal government to lower levels of governments. Right? And yes, there are other implicit liabilities. Here in Ontario, the provincial government uh, has a liability to clean up and dispose of the uh, nuclear waste from the nuclear power plants that are provincially owned. Right? Changes in demographic trends, such as an aging population or Canadians living longer, may pose additional problems for governments. At the federal level, spending on old age security will likely rise as more people age and get older, and as they live longer and get the old age security for more years. At the provincial level, more people living longer and more people getting into senior citizen range, a greater percentage of the population being in their 60s and 70s and whatever, then at the provincial level, spending on health care may also rise these implicit liabilities matter tremendously and depend dramatically on, like we mentioned, demographic trends. It's wonderful that Canadians are living longer, but it poses difficulties for governments to finance all of their promises, all these implicit liabilities. And like I say, this is effectively another version of debt. We don't want the actual debt to be so much that the government has to default on their promises because someday you want to get old and have a retirement, and same with me. Okay? Until then, stay safe, right? And take care of yourself.